Praise to God the 
Just die. 
She's one of me and Macy's really closest friends from school. And we've recently brought her to youth group, and she really loved it. And she decided to get baptized today. So that's what we're doing. Okay. Turn. Okay. Turn. <laughs> okay. So repeat after me. I believe, I believe that, Jesus the Christ, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. The Son of the living God. And I accept him, and I accept him as my Lord and Savior. My Okay, Allie, upon your great confession, we're going to baptize you <laughs> in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ and raised to walk again. <laughs> amen, amen. Hey, before you have a seat, turn to someone around you and uh, wish them happy Easter. So good to see every one of you. Welcome. Good morning.
Feel free to have a seat. Happy Easter, everyone. We're so, so glad you're here. One of our prayers for you is that uh, this afternoon, uh, hopefully when you're with your families, you're thinking back to the morning, that you would say, I met Jesus at Antioch this morning. That's our prayer for you. And that you would discover your purpose in Him. So we've discovered a purpose that we believe is worth living for. We believe it's worth dying for, to love God, to love people, and to make disciples. And we believe in it so much that it's become our mission here at Antioch. And so we want to not only invite you here to the church, but invite you into the mission. Every one of you, every one of us, have something to offer that mission, to love God, love people, and to make disciples in our lifetime. So thank you for being here. Thank you for joining. My question for you is, do you have peace in your life? Because I believe that peace is found when you find your purpose in Jesus Christ. So join us on mission. Join us with our purpose here at Antioch Christian Church. We're so glad you're here. Happy Easter to every one of you. Hey, uh, right out in our lobby, uh, we have just a next step for you. Maybe you've been here for 10 minutes. Maybe you've been here for 10 months. Or maybe you've been here for 10 years. We'd love to have a conversation with you. So I know the lobby's really busy after service, but still we would love to talk to you. So stop by our Connect in 5 area. Just a few minutes. We'll tell you a little bit about the church. We would love to be able to hear from you as well. Uh, you'll also see a photo booth right there. So if you want to get a picture of you, your friends, your family, please stop by uh, for that opportunity as well. One more potential next step for you is this coming Saturday is Discover Antioch. So it's on a Saturday, 4.30, so it's prior to service. Register for it online. We would love to see you here. This is a great way uh, to get on a team, to team up here at Antioch and to be part of the ministry that continues to grow. We'd love for you to be a part of that. I absolutely am grateful and thankful uh, to be a part of a church uh, that is on mission, a part of a church that gathers together to worship Jesus. Have you had a chance to look around yet? If not, would you? Would you just look around this room and look at this gathering for just a moment? And as you do, can we just give the praise to the Lord? This is seriously amazing. God is so good and he's so faithful. And I'm thankful to be a part of a church that gathers together to worship Jesus and then scatters to tell people about Jesus. I'm so thankful to be a part of a church that prioritizes the next generation. We just got to see water, the waters of baptism, the next generation, passing the baton of faith on. I'm so thankful to be a part of a church that's not content to stay in just our four walls, but about five years ago launched another campus in Olwine, and about two years ago launched another campus at Stony Point. And we continually keep our eyes to the horizon to see what other ministry opportunities or campuses God will bring to us in the future as we faithfully follow Him. I'm so thankful to be a part of this church. So when you give to God, when you give back to Him at Antioch, you're investing in the kingdom. You're investing in eternity and lives for Jesus Christ. I'm so thankful to be a part of a church that has a singular mindset, a singular focus, a singular mission on loving God, loving people, and making disciples, and has been for the last 50 years. So thank you for being a part of this journey. I'm so thankful that we get to see people go down to the waters of baptism week in and week out, giving their life to Jesus Christ. Thanks for investing in it in every area of your life. Uh, speaking of baptism, there's a video we want to show you of a few people that gave their life to Christ this last weekend. So let's watch it. We'll praise the Lord when we do together. All right. Now I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ and raised to walk in the newness of life. I now baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ, and raised to walk in the newness of life. Buried with Christ, raised to walk in newness of life. Buried with Christ, raised to walk in newness of life. Congratulations. Buried with Christ, raised to walk in newness of life. Buried with Christ, raised to walk in the newness of life. Amen. <laughs> Come on, Stony Point Online O-Wine here at Marion. Guys, he did it. He did it. <laughs> Jesus did it. He conquered death. He rose from the dead. Come on, he did it. He did it. And all of his dying, he did it. Man, what a gift, what a privilege it is to worship someone like him. You realize that the purpose of our faith, the core of our religion, it is not just doing the right thing. It's not just getting a little better. It's not improving yourself as a person. The core of our faith is a person, is a person, a person who was God, who came to this planet and took the weight of all of humanity's sin and death on his shoulders, 
buried in the ground, rose from the dead, and invites us to join him in living, in living not a little while and not a little bit, but living forever and living to the full. He did it. He did it. And what a gift it is to be following someone like him. And so, man, guys, uh, I got to tell you, this is like of all the Sundays, uh, I'm Jason, by the way, if, you, if we haven't met before, uh, of all the Sundays, like when you're a preacher, this is kind of like the Super Bowl Sunday uh, of, uh, of, of church Sundays. And so people oftentimes are like, all right, man, you know, woo, gotta bring a good one, right? You gotta, you gotta really, uh, and so guys, honestly, I'm just, I'm totally making this one up as I go. I, I figured I'm going to wing it and uh, we'll just see how, uh, how things turn out. Uh, <laughs> it's funny. In all honesty, uh, I got a, um, I, I have a simple word that I want to share for you. This has been on my heart for, for several months, that this, of all the things that we would talk about this year, uh, this is a pretty simple message. And so uh, I just, I, prefacing this, I, I want to read a word from, from, from Jude. Uh, this is just a little tiny letter at the very back of your Bible. It's right before Revelation. Uh, this is actually Skylar White's, uh, maybe one of his favorite books in the Bible. He actually named his son uh, after this book. And so you'll be hearing more preaching from this uh, uh, later on. It'll probably be from Skylar. Uh, but I, I want to share just a few verses with you before we get into this message. It's in, it's in Jude. It's only one chapter. In verse 22, it says this. Be merciful to those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence. This is Jesus presenting us to God in his glorious presence without fault and with great joy to the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Can you say amen to that? Amen. And, but I, I want to point something out to you in this, in, in, in Jude, in that 22nd verse. Uh, this is not a bumper sticker. This is not a, a, a blogger. This is not somebody's opinion. This is the word of God in Jude 22. Be merciful to those who doubt. Now, I know that uh, uh, there are, are many of you who are easily caught up in uh, what, what happens today. Uh, you're excited about the ham that's probably cooking right now. Uh, you've got your family gathered. You love to dress up on this day. Uh, you just look forward to this. But uh, some of you are here because somebody brought you here. Some of you are here and you hear, you know, kind of the, uh, the joyousness of this gathering. You think, man, wouldn't that be nice? Uh, can I just t t share a word from God for you? A word from God for you. Be merciful to those who doubt. If there is a part of you that, that looks at this and says, man, I find it hard to believe that there was a man who walked this planet whose father was God. I find it hard to believe that, that he died, that his death had really any significance beyond uh, sentiment, and that he actually rose from the dead. I find that hard to believe that there could be a person who could conquer death. But I just, I want to propose this to you uh, in, in the notion of being merciful to those who doubt. One, I want to say that I'm glad you're here. Uh, your skepticism is not an offense to God that he can't get over. Uh, you, haven't, you haven't rubbed him the wrong way. He's not irritated by you. Uh, in fact, he's, he is gracious and loving and compassionate with you, just like he is with me, just like he is with every human being who fails and every one of us do. Uh, but I, I just want to propose a question if, if, you're, if you're steeped in doubt, isn't there a, isn't there a part of you that, that wants it to be true? I mean, in the midst of all of the, the junk of the world, of all the things that are just so tattered and frayed and broken, isn't there something in you that says, man, I, I, I want that to be true? And I would just ask you that over these next few minutes that we have together, uh, we're, I'm just going to share an eyewitness, eyewitness account from Luke chapter 24 uh, of, of the resurrection of Jesus, the stories that were gathered 2,000 years ago uh, to testify to his resurrection. Could you just entertain uh, for this time the possibility of it being true? How different life would be if it was true that there is life after life, it is that it would be true that death isn't the master of us all, that it isn't the inevitable thing that conquers everybody, that there was someone who conquered death. All right? So we're going we're gonna to entertain that. And I think that uh, it might feel like a, uh, you ever had the, this notion, of like this thought of a, like a, a shred of doubt? For you, it might just be a shred of like just this little thread, this tiny inkling of faith that says maybe, just maybe, I would love for that to be true. 
Can I tell you that Jesus said that if you have faith, it's like a mustard seed, a tiny amount of faith, that it could move mountains. It could even say to trees, a, a, a mulberry tree, to be uprooted and planted in the ocean. God can do a lot with a tiny bit of faith. And I am asking the Lord on this very morning, in this very conversation, that he might move your heart to another step with him. That he might move your heart to accept that Jesus conquered death and he wants to share that with you. Father in heaven, I thank you for your son Jesus. Lord, I thank you for the power of his life that was manifested not just in, in miracles and in abundance and, and in powerful things, uh, but was manifested in humility and sacrifice in putting other people ahead of himself. Thank you, Father, that when we look to Jesus, he's literally the, the best that humanity could possibly be. Lord, he's the only one among us that is really human. Father, we thank you for him. We thank you that he's invited us to follow him. Lord, to the sacrifice of the cross, yes, to deny ourselves, take up a cross and follow him, to be a people that serve and sacrifice and love the way that Jesus loves. But Father, I thank you and I praise you that it is the resurrection that follows the cross, that it is the promise of life after life and life upon life that Jesus gives. And so Lord, we want that so badly to be true. And we say to you, Father, have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so uh, a few years ago, somebody showed me some, uh, uh, some interesting pictures from something called the Burning House Project, and the idea was that if your house was on fire, what would you get? Now, I, what would you try to save from the house? Now, I realize this is kind of a ridiculous notion because if, it, if your house is on fire, you're probably mostly just going to get out with your boxer shorts. Uh, and you're just going to try to get out as quick as you can. But it, let's entertain the thought. If your house was on fire, what would you, what would you save? Because I think a lot of it says, you know, what's important to you, what you value the most, this sort of thing. And so I think most of the pictures end up showing up like, like this, you know. There's a, a guitar, you know, maybe you grab your computer or, or whatever nonsense this is at the bottom. Uh, this is, this is kind of standard, right? Uh, I like the next one, though. There were some interesting things. Th this guy, obviously, is planning on doing some cooking after the fire. Uh, to be honest with you, though, I don't, I don't know if this guy understands how fire works. <laughs> like, I feel like the skillet and the Dutch oven are going to be fine. <laughs> like, he could have saved some other stuff and then gotten the pots afterward. I don't know. Maybe there's something in the pot, like money. I don't know. Uh, interesting, right? Let's see the next one. Uh, <laughs> just can't help it. This one's so funny to me. Uh, as you can see over here in New England, as it comes across the Midwest, uh, <laughs> I'm really sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> I, the, the whole time, when I knew this thing was going to happen, uh, I was very excited about this, and all I could think is like, meteorologist Jason Ishmael is going to you should see, uh, she's going to make sure she gets her lipstick. I mean, this is a legit thing. This woman says that she's a, uh, a self-proclaimed, uh, like, like beauty-obsessed fa fashionista. She's going to make sure she gets her Versace out. Like, like, how ridiculous is getting perfume out of the burning house? But I want to call your attention to two things. One, heels front and center. She's going to make sure, she's going to make sure she gets the heels. But the dog barely makes the picture. <laughs> The dog just barely made it. The heels are fine, though. How about the next one? I like this one a lot. Uh, some things you would expect. You know, I, this is like a towel or a blanket or something. I think this is the water filter, a camping stove, but what's the machete for? <laughs> like, is this person suspecting arson? You know, like, I'm going to find that person, and I've got a machete when I do. Uh, I don't know. This is, uh, this is interesting to me. I think this next person's really got it, though. <laughs> You're going to get out with ruffles, Twix, some dip, and uh, yes, a cup of coffee. <laughs> what would you rescue? I have a feeling that for most of us, the, the, the things that we would get, the what's that we would get are probably more likely to be who's. Uh, they probably got names. It's the, the people that you love the most. It's your kids. If you've got uh, a, a parent or, or grandparents to live with, you're going to make sure they get out. Or you're going to make sure you get your pet out. Some of you are going to make sure you even get your fish out. Uh, nobody cries about fish when they die, right? Uh, <laughs> but who are you going to rescue? I find it interesting in Jude, that notion of being snatched from the fire. You realize that Jesus comes into this world that is full of dying, and he rescues us with his living. He rescues us. If you would allow him to carry you out, he is here to rescue. He's here to rescue you. 
Uh, But I know that when you consider the hope of Jesus, for some of us, the idea of hoping in something is a dangerous proposition. Because you've been disappointed too many times in your life to open yourself up to hope again. But I just want to ask you to entertain that thought. Entertain the notion of it, of it being true, of it being true that what it says in Luke chapter 4, 24 could actually happen. So let's open there together and we're just going to read the account. This is Luke 24. Jesus has already died. He's been publicly crucified. He's been, he's been buried and, and now uh, they're picking up the pieces. Here's what happens in verse 1. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. Jesus predicted this himself. Uh, In fact, in John chapter 2, one of the most famous predictions of this is that he says, destroy this temple and I'll rebuild it in three days. They freaked out when they heard this. It's taken 46 years to rebuild it, to build this temple. And this guy says he's going to build it in three days. What he says in John is the, uh, the account says he was referring to his own body. They didn't understand him. He was referring to his own resurrection. They didn't understand until after the fact. They finally put two and two together. They remembered his words in verse nine. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the 11 and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women because their words to them seemed like nonsense. Think about it. If you were to have received news like this, uh, just, just imagine like the, the, the terrible time that they've had, the, the, the trauma of the three days that they've experienced. This man that they'd hung all their hope in, this man that their whole lives were wrapped up in, they witnessed his miracles, they heard his teachings, they saw the things that Jesus did, and now all of the things that were supposed to happen through him are done because he's dead. He's dead and in the grave, and every hope has died with him. Now they have this proclamation from angels that he's not dead. Why do you look for the dead among the living? He's risen, he's alive, just like he told you. They're absolutely astonished by this. So they they run to tell the news to the apostles. I mean, can you imagine if you had something so good to say like this, like how it could come out of your mouth? If if, if it's so exciting and it's so extraordinary, it's so impossible that as you're saying it, it's almost impossible. Would you talk slowly or would you talk quickly? Would your heart rate be low or would your heart rate be up? You know how this is going to go. You've been through some Christmas mornings. You already know what it's like to like be really excited about something. Here these women are running in. That's all, folks. How do you even talk? How do you even talk? Peter, in verse 12, however, he got up and he ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves and he went away wondering to himself what happened. What? It's still not getting through to them. It's such an astonishing, unbelievable thing. Be merciful to those who doubt. Even these guys in the midst of seeing it firsthand, it's almost too good to believe. Now that same day in verse 13, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, "Uh, what are you discussing together as you walk along? Uh, It's a very nice intro to the conversation. Hey, guys, you want to talk with me too? Okay, sure, that's what they do. They stood still, their faces downcast. Can you see their posture right now? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. I love how coy he's he's playing this. It's incredible. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped. 
we had hoped, all the most crushing words, we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. I I think these are, uh, in my opinion, the, the saddest words in the New Testament. We had hoped. As it concerns Jesus, to string that, that sentence together, we had hoped. And again, I know some of you are, are in, in the midst of, of skepticism and doubt, and, and I have a very strong feeling that you're there for what really are good reasons. You didn't just wake up one day and decide, uh, hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just be obstinate about this. I'm gonna try to reject something that I know would be good for me uh, because I just wanna be obstinate. I, I think for many people, uh, what leads to doubt is oftentimes something that has happened in their lives, something that you had hoped in, uh, and, and it might be something that's happened to somebody that you've loved. It might be something that, that you wish God had intervened, something that enrages you, something that frustrates you, where you have said to the heavens with a clenched fist, God, where were you when this happened? Your prayers seem to have been met with silence. It seems like everybody else is having such a great time, but you're the one person in the world that God doesn't seem to care about. You had hoped And can you just, for a moment, could you just allow yourself, could you open yourself up? And I know the risk of this because you know the disappointment of hope, but could you just open yourself up for a moment to the possibility that maybe this actually did happen? Maybe this isn't a massive conspiracy. Maybe the whole world isn't lying about it. Maybe it's true that what these guys are experiencing, what Jesus did and accomplished actually is true. You see, they had hoped, but that's about to change. In verse 22, in addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. You can obviously tell, like, there's a part that's like, okay, I hear what you're saying, guys. You went to the tomb, you didn't see the body. There's a lot of plausible explanations for that, right? Like, maybe somebody went in and stole it. Maybe there's some kind, of, uh, some kind of conspiracy. Maybe, I don't know, maybe it never died. Something happened uh, that, that, that has taken. I'll believe that he's alive when I see him alive. I think there's a lot of folks, that they, that's, uh, even for them, that are experiencing this firsthand, there's a part of them that is saying, if, if I see him, then I'll believe. But this is what he's, that Jesus replies in 25. Here they are, walking to Emmaus, talking with these guys. They still don't know who he is. He said to them, Jesus said to them, how foolish you are. And how slow to believe all that the prophets had spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Now, Luke just moves on here to verse 28. And I'm thinking like, okay, like, can you give us like some of that conversation? Like, I got time, man. Like Luke 24 and a half, we could just wedge it right in here between verse 27 and 28. Like, what would he say? But just imagine, we can, we can imagine some of the places that he might go. Psalm 22, 600 years, almost 600 years before Jesus uh, was crucified, describes his crucifixion in, in such unbelievable detail. Uh, they divide my clothes up. They cast lots for my clothing. My, uh, my, my arms and my feet are pierced. I mean, literally in Psalm 22, uh, there are things Isaiah says to describe Jesus uh, throughout the Old Testament. This is not Jesus who showed up into this world, was the, at the wrong place at the wrong time and ended up on the cross. This is a God who eternally willed that he would sacrifice for his children. Even when they would rebel against him, your, your sin, my sin did not surprise him. My skepticism and doubt and the things that I've wrestled through in my life were not shocking to him. No, no, he's been ahead of it all the time. That even when we were his enemies, it says in Romans, that he died for us. Even when he had nothing to gain from us, we had nothing to offer us, he would still die for us. What an incredible thing. But here they are, they're, 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 they're still connecting with it. Jesus describing all of these things that he had already intended, even in the Old Testament. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further. I think it's just like, this is like poker playing Jesus. Uh, In verse 29, but they urged him strongly, stay with us for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Does that sound a little bit familiar to you? Man, this is the last supper. It's the same thing. 
Then, in that moment, then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? What, a, what an incredible experience. They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, it is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. I mean, what an incredible thing. What an incredible thing. Does it make your heart burn a little bit? Is there a, is there a fire that ignites in you with the possibility that this is true? Man, I'm going to tell you, there is something about living, and I've said this many times, there is something about living, and it isn't just survival instinct in me. Like, when, I, when I'm living, I want to keep living. There's not a part of me that says, I've had enough of living, I'm done living. Like, when things are good, don't you want them to keep going well? Isn't there a part of you that just, like, oh, you know what, Grandma, I've had enough of this visit. I don't ever want to see you again. Like, no, like, you want to, you want to be with her. I mean, think about it. For some of you guys right now, because it's a special holiday, you got your grandbabies with you. Uh, what are they going to be like for those that have to travel uh, when they head home? I don't know any grandkids that are happy to leave their grandparents. They cry like crazy. Why? Because they want to keep going with what is good. They understand this is right. This is good. I love this experience. I want to keep going in this. And when I am in this moment with Jesus, I, I don't want to stop. And if it's true, right? I want it to be true. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, what do you say? Like when you've been, uh, you've been in the grave for three days and then you show back up to the people that you love, you know, like to your friends. What's the, like, like what would you say? You know, like, ta-da! Like, like, I just don't know what you're supposed to say. But this is what Jesus says. He says, peace be with you. Imagine all the turmoil of the days that they've been in. Their hopes have been dashed. They have been running for their lives. They have been hiding in fear. And Jesus comes and speaks a word of peace over them in that moment. What a powerful word that is. He is still speaking peace to you in this moment. He is still speaking peace over his people, his people that are struggling, his people that are fighting for their lives. He, in his resurrection power, is still proclaiming peace to you. Peace to you. They were startled and frightened. <laughs> peace be with you. Ah! They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. I mean, guys, this is how far down the path that they have gotten. This is how far into despair that when they see resurrected Jesus, it is a more immediately plausible explanation that they are seeing a ghost than they are seeing Jesus in his resurrection. That is deep in despair. God, be merciful for those who doubt. Because look at these guys. They're seeing resurrected Jesus and they're afraid and they think they've seen a ghost. Like, what could Jesus do at this point? Man, what do I have to do with you guys? idiots and he just disappears he's not frustrated by this he stays with them he says why are you troubled and why do doubts rise in your minds verse 39 look at my hands and my feet it is i myself touch me and see a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see i have when he had said this he showed them his hands and feet and while they still did not believe because of joy and amazement. Think about that. They didn't hold their, their doubts out of, uh, out of skepticism. There wasn't some sort of intellectual hang up in this moment. Out of joy and amazement. It was so good that they're seeing Jesus in this moment that it's hard to believe it. It's so good. I mean, you've heard that phrase before, but have you ever really experienced it? This is so good, I can't, even, I can't even believe it. My mind can't even reconcile the notion that I'm seeing Jesus alive right now. Jesus that I saw crucified. Jesus that we saw laid in the tomb out of joy and amazement. This is hard to believe. And then Jesus, he responds, do you have anything here to eat? What? <laughs> okay. They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and he ate it in their presence. I mean, I always think about this text the same way. Like, like Jesus takes the fish and he like, mm, see, see, I'm, I'm eating. 
I'm eating, and they, they're expecting, like, I guess what, like he swallows them, and like it falls on the floor or something? See, it's a ghost! I knew it! I knew it! And how human, you know? How quaint is this demonstration of resurrection? He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are my witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. He's talking about a spirit. We see this happen in the book of Acts. When the Holy Spirit comes to these men. Uh, their, their entire lives are completely changed. Uh, in fact, the entire world is changed as a result of what happens in the following pages. And what an extraordinary thing. The notion that, that Jesus would rise from the dead. Uh, you see, here's the reality. Uh, When we talk about Jesus, when we talk about our faith, when we talk about the core of our faith and what it is about, uh, understand in no way, shape, or form am I attempting to diminish the importance of the cross. But you have to understand something about the resurrection. The resurrection is not just a cherry on top of the gospel Sunday. It is not some extra little piece to make an otherwise sad story have a happy ending. The resurrection is the reason this has power. The resurrection, this is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, that if Jesus had not risen from the dead, that we are still in our sins. Because this is a man who came into the fire. He came into all of this dying, and he's the only one who can get out. You see, if Jesus can't get out, you know what that means for me? You know what that means for you? That means that you're stuck. Again, it's just 1 Corinthians 15. If Christ has not risen from the dead, that we are still in our sins. Paul said, I'm passing this gospel, this good news to you, as a matter of first importance. First importance. I'll read it to you. In 1 Corinthians 15. We got time for one more text. Is that all right with you? I mean, I don't know why I ask questions like that, but <laughs> I'm trying to be polite, you know, but uh, I guess if, you, if you're going to say no, you could, but... I'm like, yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> okay, I'm still going to do it. Uh, and I love this. We'll just go through a few of these. Uh, brothers and sisters, verse one, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you. Uh, it's good to be reminded of the gospel. It's good to be reminded of the good news. I pray that you're reminded of the good news every time you take a breath, that you don't have to die, that Jesus conquered death, that there is hope in him that doesn't disappoint I preach to you this, uh, this gospel which you received and which you've taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Guys, if, if there is something that is of greater importance than what Paul is about to say, if something is ahead of the line of Jesus, it is an idol and it needs to be taken down. If anything or anyone or any ambition or any thought is ahead of Jesus, it's in the wrong place because only Jesus deserves to be first. He deserves to be first. Who else could you imagine that is worthy of being followed? You are following someone. You're following someone inevitably. Who is worthy of being followed? He's the only one. I passed on to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, that he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, and to the twelve. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me, to one as abnormally born. That's how Paul describes himself. For I'm the least of the apostles, and do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me is not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preached, and this is what you believed. And he continues to just open up this thought. He he, he says that eventually, if, if Christ in 17, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. And what a, what a word that is. If Christ has not been raised, he says in 19, if, if, this, is a, if this is the only, if this is for the life we have hope in Christ, we, if, if this didn't happen, 
We are of all people most to be pitied. You see, I, I want to propose to you through two notions that they, if there's a part of you that wants it to be true, I think God can use that. Because I want to propose the, the other side of this. What if it isn't true? What if this really is just a collection of lies and conspiracies that millions and millions of people for the last 2,000 years have been deceived into lifestyles of kindness and generosity and humility and service, but they've been deceived into that, and it was all just a waste and a fake meant to, con uh, meant to control them and meant to take from them. Because obviously it's just for money, right? Imagine if that were true then what's your future here on the, the third rock from the sun spinning around, making its orbits uh, utterly alone in the dark with no one here to help you? There is no future. Do you want that to be true? And there's a part of me that looks at it and says, I, I don't want that at all. I want the life of Jesus. I want to be able to put my feet in his impossible footsteps and go somewhere I could never go on my own. To go from the, the broken man that I am, to go from the struggles that, that are me if I'm left to my own devices, the, the struggles of selfishness, the, the things that I'm inclined to, to be obsessed with that are not good. And here's Jesus saying, no, 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 that's not your life. There isn't life down that pathway. You can go a different way. You can walk a different direction. And I would say especially if you are in the midst of despair, of all people that should want this to be true, it ought to be you. And maybe today is the day that you say, finally, okay, I surrender. See what God can do. Give him, up, give him up an opportunity to be king. Let him control for a while. Let him do what only he can do. Man, if that's you, if you're going to make a decision like that today, just tell him, God, I'm yours. I surrender. I surrender. I trust that Jesus is actually who you say he is. I want this to be true. And God, I don't know much beyond that. I just want it to be true. Can you use that? And I would tell you, yes, you can. If that's you today, why don't you talk to somebody about it? Go to the lobby. Go to Next Steps. Go to, go to Skyler if you're in, at Stony Point. Go to Carl in Old Wine. Talk to me. Talk to somebody up in our lobby. Pray with Luke. Say, I want this to be true, but I don't know how. And I believe God could take you. Jesus said, crossing over from death to life. I think he can cross you over from death and into life. With a little bit of faith, mountains move, trees uprooted, thrown into the ocean. Imagine what he can do with you. Father in heaven, I thank you so much for your son, Jesus. Lord, I thank you for his generosity to say that the resurrection that he walked was not just for him but he shares it with us. We actually get to participate in his resurrection and the greatest thing that has ever happened, he is gathering us up and saying, come with me. Walk with me into life, into joy, into peace. Go with me somewhere that no one could possibly go if I don't open the door. Thank you, God, for the truth of the hope of the resurrection of Jesus. And when we talk about resurrection, it's a promise, God, that he makes, a promise that he keeps. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Man, would you hold on to this with me? In 1 Corinthians 10, uh, what we're about to do is described as a, uh, the Greek word is koinonia. The bread and the juice are a koinonia. This word means fellowship or participation or partnership. A fellowship and a partnership in the, in the body and blood of Jesus. Think about how ridiculous this is. Of all the things that could be done for you, that you and I get to join Jesus in his broken body and his resurrection. Can we participate with him? Can we join in the greatest thing that has ever been done right now? Hold on to this bread. And Jesus said this, inviting us to take part, to take pro part in the cross, to take part in the resurrection. That is his promise. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and when he given thanks, he broke it gave it to his disciples and he told them this is my body given for you do this in remembrance of me
In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup. He held it before his disciples and he told them, this is the blood of a new covenant shed for you. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Can somebody say thank you, Jesus? Can somebody say he did it? He did it. He did it. Let's worship the resurrected king. Stand to your feet. Let's go. Yes, we thank you, Jesus. Come on, church. Let's sing this together. I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on the cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears they laid him down in Joseph's tomb, the entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still and all alone. Oh, praise the name.
you brothers and sisters that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable listen I tell you a mystery we will not all sleep but we will all be changed in a flash in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet for the trumpet will sound the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed for the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, oh death, is your victory? Where, oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God. He gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He has done it. He's done it. Go live, live like Jesus lives. Love God, love people, make disciples.
Happy Resurrection Days.